We all know that terrible crimes were perpetrated against Israelis on October 7th by Hamas. Or do we? Because it seems like the UN is playing catch up. No other conflict that I can think of has had sort of a contextualization of rape. We'll be exploring this and more on Today Unpacked's This Week Unpacked by Unpacked. Unpacked. Chapter one, the wrap up, where we'll look at the top five stories from this week in Jewish and Israel news. Number five, there goes the ceasefire. Seven days of ceasefire have come to an end and the war is back on in full force as Israel consolidates its hold on northern Gaza. The IDF has also started operations in southern Gaza, where Hamas's leadership is suspected to be hiding underground. So the IDF is considering flooding the tunnels with seawater. Side note, Hamas refers to the October 7th massacre as the Al-Aqsa Flood. Number four, the Bibas family. Though Hamas had previously agreed to release all child hostages and their mothers, they refused to release the youngest hostage. They claimed without evidence that four-year-old Ariel Bibas, his brother, 10-month-old Kfir, and their mother, Shiri, had been killed in an Israeli airstrike. Then they released a propaganda video of their father, Yarden, crying after being told that his children and wife had been killed in an Israeli airstrike. Number three, the Philly cheesesteak and anti-Semitism sandwich. On Sunday, a mob descended on Goldie Falafel, a kosher vegan falafel shop in Philadelphia. Why? Because it's owned by Israeli-American chef Michael Solomonov, who donated money to Israel's life-saving ambulance service after the October 7th massacre. Pennsylvania's politicians were quick to condemn the protesters, and the following Monday, locals showed up in droves to support Solomonov. Number two, Ivy League anti-Semitism goes to Washington. On Tuesday, the heads of three top American colleges were called before Congress and admitted that anti-Israel protests on campus sometimes cross the line. UPenn's president, Liz McGill, said that calls for the murder of Jews could potentially be cause for expulsion, but added, It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. There's no right context. And number one, the UN realizes that Israeli women are women. After eight weeks of silence, UN women finally condemned the sexual violence against women on October 7th perpetrated by Hamas. And at a UN conference led by Israel, roughly 800 people, including diplomats and world leaders, watched and listened to graphic testimony. Welcome to the party, pal! Chapter 2, Antiviral. Let's look at two stories going viral on social media this week. Number 1, Jayapal. U.S. Representative Pramila Jayapal drew serious backlash after a recent CNN interview. When asked why progressive women have been silent on the mass sexual violence of October 7th, Jayapal said, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's true. And then immediately turned the question around to criticize Israel. When pressed, she clarified, Sexual assault is horrific. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestinians. Jewish groups blasted Jayapal for her statement. She later clarified, saying that her comment about balance was not about rape and not intended to minimize rape and sexual assault in any way. Number two, Beyonce. She might not be a politician, but she's arguably more influential than most legislators out there. Her new movie, Renaissance, is currently being screened worldwide, including in Israel. Pro-Palestinian fans have criticized her for not pulling the film from Israeli theaters and put out calls for her to speak out against the situation in Gaza. Curiously, no one put out any calls for Beyonce to weigh in on the Syrian civil war, the genocide in Burma, the concentration camps for Uyghurs in China, or the wars in Yemen and Sudan. Chapter 3, Beyond the Echo Chamber. This week, we'll look at that UN meetup and see how it's being reported on in English, Hebrew, and Arabic media around the world. Not surprisingly, Hebrew media has been filled with reports about the UN meetup on sexual violence against women on October 7th. Also not surprisingly, Arabic media has mostly ignored the topic, with most Arabic language sites having absolutely no articles on the subject. Arabic media is mostly focusing on the war in Gaza and the deteriorating humanitarian situation. But what I found most interesting about the reporting is the BBC and Sky News' reporting on the subject, because the BBC and Sky News both have English and Arabic language sites. The headline article on the BBC News English language website was about the October 7th sexual assaults. But on BBC Arabic, there was nothing, not a single article. One more article that I thought was interesting came from Panet, which is an Israeli Arab Arabic language news site. And they arguably had among the most balanced reporting on this subject, reporting on the sexual assaults as well as Hamas's denials. 
For me, the lesson from the BBC and Sky News is that probably for all media outlets, at least when it comes to Israel, the tail is kind of wagging the dog. They're not telling people what they need to know, they're telling people what they want to hear. And so while you can get news from media outlets, you can also get a sense of what the media outlet's target audience wants to hear. It's kind of like a poll of opinions out there. For those of us who would like to actually know what's going on, my recommendation is to read as many sources as possible, including Arabic language and Hebrew. Remember, in Google Chrome, you can right-click and translate. If I read enough sources, I generally feel like the truth is somewhere in the middle. Chapter four, zooming out. This week I met with Adi Elbaz, the writer of much of Unpacked's content, both in our Unpacking Israeli History podcast, as well as our sister channel, Unpacked. I asked Adi to zoom out and give us some context about what's going on with the UN. Looking at the things that happened this week, particularly at the UN and particularly at the testimony that was given uh, on the House floor, we see kind of a pattern emerge. We see a pattern of minimization of violence, whether it's verbal, whether it's actual physical, whether it's sexual, specifically against Jews and Israelis. So unfortunately, sexual violence is a it's a tool of war, a horrible, ugly tool of war. Disproportionately, it affects women, although it also does affect men. And there is testimony that it affected men on October the 7th. But no other conflict that I can think of has had sort of a contextualization of rape appended to it. So when lawmakers are talking about the rapes of women in Ukraine or the kidnapping of girls in Nigeria by Boko Haram, nobody is contextualizing their rapes. In fact, there's only full-throated condemnation. So it, it, it's just very, very difficult to ignore what looks like a glaring double standard. Chapter five, Ask a Bunny. This week I met with Sharon Katz, one of my most favorite people in the whole world. She's a producer of films, musical theater, and dance performances. And I asked her for her advice for those grandkids out there who are experiencing anti-Semitism on their college campuses. Get out of a toxic anti-Semitic environment and come home to your family, not just your family in Boston or New York or Tennessee, but your family, the Jewish people, your family that is here to support you get to know the broader Jewish community and get your strength from that. This week, I asked our guest, Adi Elbaz, where's the meat in this week's Torah portion? Joseph of the Technicolor Dreamcoat is sold into slavery by his brothers. And eventually he rises through the ranks of sort of Egyptian nobility. But his stratospheric rise to the top is curtailed when the wife of Potiphar, who is sort of the big man that Joseph has been sold to, um, sexually assaults him and then accuses him of raping her. But I do think it's very interesting that this week's Parsha touches on the concept of sexual violence and how it's used to build a narrative to further political ends. Chapter Chapter 7, Looking Ahead. Keep an eye out for how the U.S. government's continuing battle over funding for the wars in Israel and Ukraine unfold, as Republicans try to fund Israel but ditch funding for Ukraine, and progressive Democrats try to tie Israel's funding to the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And that's all for Today Unpacked, This Week Unpacked by Unpacked, Unpacked. And if you've gotten this far in the episode, please take a moment to like, subscribe, or comment. We'd love to hear your thoughts.